The deliberate use of vehicles as a weapon to assault large crowds of people is becoming an increasingly common terrorist tactic, in part due to the ease of access to motor vehicles. These ramming types of attacks have occurred recently to disrupt peaceful protests, interrupt large public gatherings, or as part of a larger active assailant attack against civilians and critical infrastructure nationwide. To assess the threat and identify what can be done to mitigate these attacks, we look to federal and local law enforcement, counterterrorism experts, and the private sector to learn how they see this emerging threat. So since last year when we saw a truck be used to attack pedestrians in Nice, France, we've really seen a lot of additional attacks using vehicles uh, throughout the, the world. Uh, both passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles. Um, so certainly that's something that we're concerned with and working with the public and private sector to counter that potential threat. When we think about vehicle ramming specifically, it's not a new type of incident. It's something that's been happening. We've seen in f even really the past decade. But when you look at 2014 through 2017, where we've had at least 17 attacks, and really 2016 and 2017, where we've had 10 attacks nationally, it's more frequent. And the reason there is it's easy. It's easy access All to get a vehicle, a truck, it's easy access. You're not scrutinized. In many of the old cases that we dealt with, if people were looking to develop a weapon of mass destruction or build an IED, a lot of times they have to reach out to other people. To get a truck or to get a car, you need a driver's license, so the ability to rent a truck possibly. So it's ease of access. And with the number of public events, it's easy to plan for, too. We know when there's going to be a race, a Christmas market. Uh, it's publicized in the papers and local media because people want folks to come out for their events and also makes it easy for people to plan for a terrorist event, too, and target those types of events. I think there's been, uh, over the last 15 years, a general trend line uh, away from uh, highly orchestrated, highly resource-intensive, and meticulously planned attacks to more of a DIY, do-it-yourself kind of violence. We have seen a greater and greater encouragement of do-it-yourself violence, uh, beginning really with uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, inspiring the believers to execute violence on their own without organizational command and control. Uh, and that has been continued and really accelerated uh, through the propaganda of the so-called Islamic State which also encourages this do-it-yourself sort of violence. In order to complement their ability to conduct organizational attacks, they've been trying to inspire lone individuals or lone groups of individuals to take up the standard of their cause and attack on their behalf, even though they have never met another person in that organization. They have no physical connectivity to the organization. So it's a way for organizations to complement um, their organizational inability to conduct a campaign of violence and still get that psychological impact of a campaign of violence, even if they're not orchestrating it or commanding and controlling it. The threat of a vehicle ramming seems daunting. With millions of vehicles on the road at any given time, what can individuals do to keep themselves safe and to identify behavior that may enable intervention to prevent an attack? What people should do if they find themselves in that situation where a vehicle is uh, being used as a weapon against pedestrians uh, the first thing is obviously is to run and get out of the way. I mean, you have to, it, it's going to happen quick. Um, it, it's going to take you a few seconds to process what's happening, uh, but you have to react as quickly as possible and get out of the way, uh, you know, get the folks with you out of the way as quick as possible. Um, the next thing is cover, trying to get behind something, something heavy. It could be a barrier to prevent things like vehicles from being used as weapons. There could be one close by, but not directly where you're at, so the vehicle is able to get access, so being able to get behind one of those barriers. Uh, but I think secondarily, we want to ensure that people get far enough away in, in case there is a secondary attack after the vehicle is used as, uh, as a weapon, as we've seen in some of the cases. Once the vehicle stopped for whatever reason, uh, we've seen a number of people exit the vehicles and use edge weapons or small arms to carry on that attack. Um, so getting as far away as possible and of course notifying law enforcement as soon as possible. I mean that's really key because law enforcement is going to be able to get there quickly and come in and, and stop the actual threat. Of course it's important to do what you can at the point of attack but again these, these are impossible to predict the exact point and moment of attack. 
However, when we look at radicalization of individuals who ultimately engage in that violent attack, that's a process. That process takes a very long time compared to the minutes uh, of time that an attack takes to unfold. Uh, when we look, for example, at foreign fighters in the United States or individuals who aspire to be foreign fighters, we found on average in 2016 a 10-month window of opportunity between when the person first started publicly speaking about it or doing something about it in an observable way. Over 85% of the individuals engaged in some sort of observable indicator that this was their intention, the kind of observable indicator that friends, employers, family, uh, soccer coaches would, would be in a position to see, not necessarily the law enforcement community. Uh, they might not have that intimate relationship where they would see these kinds of warning signs, but, but the close cadre of people around those persons they would be observable to them. I think it's pragmatic to try to focus on prevention and intervention programs because the opportunity is just so much greater there than trying to secure every soft target all the time in a free and open society that values its freedom. But that awareness is really critical. If you see something, say something. If you see something suspicious, if you see a suspicious person or persons, if you see a suspicious vehicle in an area where it really doesn't belong or something just doesn't look right, don't be afraid to report that. I mean, that's really key. You know, the law enforcement officers can't be everywhere at, at every time, um, at any given time. So I think really being able to notice something suspicious um, and look out for it, you know, and, and then report that, I think is critical and really crucial in trying to prevent those types of attacks from happening. Individuals should not have to be alone in facing a potential attack. What policies or proactive measures can organizations take to mitigate threats to the public? When you engage multiple people, as I mentioned, to build an IED or something that's a little more intricate, you're more likely to hit a tripwire that's going to alert somebody. But if somebody just walks into a, a shop to rent a van, there's typically little tripwire for them to be noticed. So it's so important for people, obviously in the trucking industry, to know who they're renting their trucks to but to establish some sort of tripwires as well, to be alert for suspicious behavior. If they see anyone making modifications to vehicles or asking for modifications to vehicles, which seem uh, unlikely to be used in, in regular transport, that is a tripwire and something they should alert the federal authorities or the local police to. But once again, just because of the ease of it, that's why the frequency has arisen. For soft targets and facilities and buildings, they're certainly going to start looking at using barriers and bollards and other type of equipment to maintain that distance between vehicle access to those facilities and to those buildings. One of the other things that we've done to work with some of the commercial industries is having a partnership between private companies that maybe could supply heavy vehicles like trucks or buses to use in a community to protect soft targets around events that are going on in the community. It could be around parades, it could be around um, other type of events, maybe sporting events and things like that, uh, where companies are willing to step up and help out their community, use those vehicles for barriers to protect pedestrians. Um, so people can go about their daily business and enjoy their, you know, their daily life and not have to worry about that potential threat. And obviously it's not pragmatic to put bollards on every single street but when there are critical infrastructures or places where there are going to be crowds, there are certain common sense things that can be done, whether it is police presence or barriers that can be moved and put into place, I think we have a responsibility as government to put those mitigation strategies into effect. But if I had a building that was glass, I might consider some sort of bollards, planters outside that once again are aesthetically attractive, that might not look like a a standard bollard, but it has the capacity to stop a truck from getting through. If you look, were to look around the U.S. Capitol, they might have some sort of portable sally ports that go up and down so you can let vehicles through when necessary, but there has to be some type of strategy. We can't do nothing. While it's important that we've identified both the nature of this emerging threat as well as countermeasures that individuals and organizations can take to mitigate an attack, it's important to ask one final question. How can we maintain this awareness of our surroundings without living our lives in fear? I think it is about uh, being mentally prepared for these things to happen, but not allowing ourselves to be intimidated by things that actually happen very, very infrequently. Um, that doesn't mean the professional counterterrorism community and law enforcement community and emergency response community 
shouldn't uh, prepare for these incidents, shouldn't prioritize um, measures that can keep, keep people safe and reduce vulnerabilities, of course we should do that. But I think we can complement that with working on our sort of societal resilience and our political resilience, not allowing ourselves to be held hostage by the potential that maybe one day someone will engage in this kind of violence. This video highlights the emerging threats associated with vehicle ramming attacks, which have targeted various large crowd gatherings throughout the United States in recent years, including attacks in New York, Charlottesville, Virginia, and Columbus, Ohio. Additionally, this video provides examples of actions that can be taken by individuals and organizations alike to prevent, mitigate, and respond to these attacks. The first step is to coordinate with law enforcement. Educate yourself and your employees on suspicious activities to promote vigilance so that when somebody sees something, they're able to say something. Be aware of behaviors that indicate a pathway to violence and promote mechanisms that encourage reporting of suspicious behaviors. Look at opportunities to implement physical security measures, both passive and active. Examine architectural solutions to provide separation between vehicles and pedestrian spaces. Finally, should the worst occur, prepare yourself to respond decisively and remove yourself and others from the scene. In many cases, attacks do not conclude when the vehicle has stopped.